Hope everyone's doing well. So yeah, today, um, as you can see by the, the slide, we have a slideshow. Um, I went back in time and used PowerPoint yesterday, um, whatever that is. So uh, if you, yeah, we're going to do that passage, that passage, Romans 8, 12 to 30. Um, if you have a Bible, I really encourage you to open it, or if you just have it on your phone, because the words are not going to be on the screen. Um, and the reason being is because it's actually a really complicated passage. Um, so sorry if your brain is in Sunday mode. Um, the reason why I've got a PowerPoint is because I'm going to try and simplify this complicated passage. And uh, yeah, I hope it works. However, I really don't know if you're going to even be able to read it from the back. So that's why you should always sit at the front. Um, yeah, basically, we're going to do this because I want us to, I really actually just hope, my simple prayer is that this would be a, an encouraging message for us um, who, you know, journey through this sometimes very difficult life. Um, and this passage really just provides me, and I hope it will provide you, with a, a framework and like a, a scaffolding, basically, to help you journey through life when, um, when life gives you lemons. So... Um, yeah, let's, let's basically just get... Oh, yeah, just one other thing. It, it is going to be confusing at times and maybe complex, and I'm really going to try to make it simple, and I really apologize. Like, I'm always super, super mindful. I didn't come from a Christian background, but church is really weird, and the things we say are really weird, and so if you find this confusing, I really apologize. I'd love to do something simple and like, hey, this is great, but um, two reasons. The Bible is a strange book, and it's really complex at times, and even those of us who've been walking with Jesus forever, you still just pick up the Bible some days and you're just like, what the heck? Like, that's not even help. I don't even know what's going on here. So that's a reality. You know, if you're a Christian, you're going to come across hard passages and we're going to try and understand one today. Um, but also life itself is this weird, confusing, sometimes discouraging and complex thing that leaves us going, what the heck? And yeah, I just want to help us to have some, some strong answers for those difficult situations that inevitably we're all going to face. So can we do this? Do you reckon, who's feeling up to, yeah, doing some thumbs up? <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's go. Romans 8, uh, 12. I'll read from the CSB, which is what probably most of us have. Um, oh, yeah. So Tim. Tim's going to be my, my buddy. And uh, so, Tim, can you go to the next slide? What we're going to do is we're going to fill in a table. And um, so this is the, the structure of the table. And as you can see on this, what is that? The left side, you've got some verses. So we're going to break it up into chunks. And then you know, across the top, there's a bit of a timeline. So there we'll see some things from a pre-Christian life, what that's like. Then we're going to see what the Christian life is like in the womb. And we're going to see what that means. And then finally, it's the end, um, which, you know, as Christians, we believe that uh, this world is not just meaninglessly moving forward, but that God is actually going to do something that is going to bring everything to the end that he intends. And, you know, we normally call this heaven or the new creation, new heavens, new earth, or eternal life or whatever, right? But so it's, in its, it's a sense the end that we're heading towards, but I've called it the end in, um, in the fingers. Um, what was that? Yeah, those things. Um, because uh, in a sense it's an end, but it's also really the final beginning in a sense. It's the, it's the, the end of the becoming process before what is eternally so is going to be eternally so, right? It's like the, the last beginning that we get to then exist with God in, in um, a world of perfect love and justice and peace and goodness, right, and, and union with God. So it's the end, but it's also the beginning, right? Are we cool? Are we cool with this? Um, my wife's downstairs with the kids, so I can't go forever because, <laughs> you know. Anyway, let's go. Romans 8, 12. Um, not my kids, by the way. Your kids. <laughs> Uh, all right, Romans 8, 12 says this. Uh, so then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Because if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 
Okay, so Tim, can you go to the next one? Boom. So we got up here in the pre-Christian life, we call it in the flesh, right? Now that's a weird phrase for sure. And it basically just means a life that's been influenced by all of the things that aren't of God, you know, the, the wrong narrative to live in, the lies that tell you, like all sorts of stuff, temptations and the sin, and you give in that, right? And so, again, there's going to be a lot of these, the flesh things. Um, so life in the flesh. Tim, if you could go to the next one. What we see is we're in this process of transformation. As you can see, I kind of got headings in the, that middle column thing. So the transformation process that we're in, you know, we call it life by the Spirit. And, and that is this um, journey whereby we are becoming what God intends us to be. So, Tim, if you could chuck up the next one. Um, it says, well, I, got, I also got to keep up on my own thing. So, um, yeah, so here we've got, it's, I've said, it's like this, this process where we go from our false self, in a way, to becoming what God intends us to be. So, by way of analogy, right, let's say you're a parent. And you raise up a child and they're just, you know, they're perfect, right? Because you're a parent, you think they're perfect. Um, I don't even know if parents think that because you probably see all their imperfections. But anyway, um, they're just really beautiful little child, really sweet, really gentle natured. And then they go off to high school and they they get involved in the wrong crowd. And they have these really stupid dropkick friends who, um, who are into drugs and all sorts of bad stuff. And you see over the years that they go on this terrible trajectory, getting influenced by these friends to, to do all those sorts of bad things. And they, they actually just really just become a mess of a life. And they're addicted to drugs and they, you know, they're stealing money all the time to try and like feed this addiction. And they've, just, they've really just gotten to the wrong stuff. And then years later, you haven't heard from them at all, they rock up on your doorstep and they're like, I need money, right, for, for, for my drug addiction. As a parent, there would be this sense in which you remember that pure, beautiful child that they were. And you would say, who you are now is not who you truly are. You've just, you've just been influenced in all the wrong ways. And it's basically warped who you are into this false version of yourself, right? That's basically the story of all of us, except for the fact that we just start like that. We grow up in this world, we learn the ways of sin, we're selfish, and you know, the world just feeds us all sorts of lies and ruins our self-worth, and we get involved in all sorts of terrible stuff. We become this like false self, right? And so that's life in the flesh, and we're now in this process of transformation whereby we walk by the Spirit, which is where God starts to teach us the right way to think and to live in these things. We become who we're truly meant to be, which is the next point. So Tim, could you chuck that one up? Um, boom, we become who God created us to be in Christ. The end of the journey, the beginning of what we're meant to be, right? Can you guys actually read that? Can Pat, can you read that in the back row? Yeah, yeah, that's a yep. That's a not a confident yep. Um, well, yeah, I hope you can. Anyway, all right, so next, that, that's, that's the first row. We're still, we're tracking, we're good with this, the whole table thing. Um, sorry, I feel like you're in school. Let's go to the next, the next um, lot of verses. So we, we'll read again at verse 14. It says, For all those uh, led by God's Spirit, what we were talking about, are God's sons. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children, and if children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And we'll we'll pause there again. So, okay, so now we move down to the next one. And it says, Tim, if you could chuck it up. Um, Oh, yeah, we used to live in this life of slavery and fear. Again, next one, Tim. And now we become sons. Um, Now, Unfortunately, because the Bible was written a long time ago, it's, it speaks its own language, right? It speaks its own culture. And when we translate it into English, we, we have to kind of be faithful to what it says, because after all, you know, that's what it first said. But we've got to change the meaning where it's relevant, right? So when it talks about becoming God's sons, obviously a son is a male thing. But this is addressed to male and female Christians. So it's, it's talking about all sorts of Christians right now. It's not gender um, specific. The reason why it does say sons, however, is because in the ancient world, they had different um, society kind of expectations and norms. And 
Only if you are the firstborn son in a family do you have the right to the full inheritance of that family. If you are a firstborn daughter, you don't have those rights. Yeah, that sucks. But this is why it says God's sons. The the simple meaning is whether you're a male or a female Christian, you become a child of God who has the full rights and the full privileges of what it means to be in God's family. That's why I've put sons in more of those little commery things. Um, so you become God's son. So Tim, if you, can, if you can chuck that up, we become children with full privileges. Um, it says that we are adopted into God's family. We receive that spirit of adoption. It says that we become heirs, which obviously means that we're going to inherit the full rights of what God intends, which is this, this future life. And uh, it, it also presents that picture of we're on this wilderness journey. So um, I always like to refer it to it as the Prince of Egypt movie. You know that Disney movie, the Prince, anyone? The Prince of, yeah, it's a good movie. Um, and it's the story of Exodus in, in, in the Bible where um, the Jewish people are in Israel and then God calls out and he says, let Israel, my son, go so that he can come out and enter my promised land, basically, and, and worship me. And so you've got this sense where in this passage, there's this, this echo of that story in the background, where here we are, we're going on this journey in our wilderness, so to say, freed from slavery and from fear, and we're heading into this promised land of this eternal life with God, where we become who we're truly meant to be. Um, all right, next one, Tim. The end, we reach that inheritance. Okay, cool. How are we doing? So I, I, I warned you, I said it was going to be like a bit bland, but, you know, we'll keep, keep going with it. Just put big smiles on to encourage me. Um, and that would be great. Okay, so now let's go verse 17, and here's where things are going to start getting a little bit more complicated. Verse 17, so if we, we zoom in on that one, I'll read it from the start of the verse. It's halfway through a sentence. If children, heirs, heirs of God... And co heirs with Christ. Now, listen to this. If indeed we suffer with Christ, so that we may also be glorified with him. If indeed we suffer with Christ, so that we may also be glorified with him. So, Tim, can you chuck up the next one? Suffer with Christ, glorified with Christ. Next verse, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. So here we are in this life, and it's actually quite difficult, right? You look around um, at the beautiful world that it is, and creation is quite beautiful, right? It's like this neutral kind of like, you know, you don't have trees sitting on one another and stuff like that. It's just like beautiful sunsets and the storms and the lightning and all that stuff. But you also look at the world and you just see brokenness, you see sickness, you just see, you know, there's pandemics of, of mental health and, and just crises and stuff happening and all, all people of all ages, really. You see massive injustice and greed and corruption and brokenness and you know, it's crazy. We live in such a bubble here. And sometimes, you know, I watch whatever, like YouTube or something like that, and you just see how terribly people in third world nations have it. And that is their life. That's birth and death and everything in between just sucks. And, and so we live in this, in this very much broken world. And Paul says this is the sufferings of this time that we are in the thick of. Now, we're in, a, in the thick of it in a particular way, which we'll get to. But he says, you know, but he has this hope where he says, ultimately, it will not compare to how good the glory is going to be at the end. So, Tim, can you check up the next one? It just says glory. Again, glory, one of those weird Christian terms that we all say so much that we almost don't know what it means anymore. Um, in a way, it's used to talk about the end, the eternal life, the heaven. It's glorious, right? It's great. Um, but it's also going to be used in a different way, which we'll see um, in a moment. Let's keep reading. And just in a moment, I'm going to break up this information assault and just tell you something ridiculous for the sake of it. Um, but it's funny. Okay, cool. So um, let's go. Verse 19. 
It says this, For creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. So we are waiting for glory to be revealed, but creation is waiting for our glory to be revealed. So there's this this inseparable connection between who we need to become and the world that God will create in the end. You can't have one without the other. We need to become who God created us to be in Christ, right? That's verse 19. Verse 20. Creation uh, was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that creation itself will also be set free uh, from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. Okay, Tim, I think we're, we're behind. Oh, yeah, let's go. Next one. So, yeah, up there again. We're sons now for sure, but that full expression of what it means to be a son of God is not yet fully seen. We're in this process of becoming that. So, yes, we're sons, but also sons and daughters, children. The full revelation of being children of God is yet to be seen. Um, all right, what else have we got, Tim? Oh, yeah, next one. Next one. So, birth, that's, that's, we'll get to that. We're in a fallen creation, and we're looking forward to this freed creation, right? So there's, there's a lot of this tension that we live in. Um, okay, now we get to the really interesting stuff. Um, what verse are we up to? This, I know, but I'm just going to test you guys. <laughs> what verse are we up to, Pat? Yes, nice. Also somewhere between 21 and 23. <laughs> no, yeah, we're up to verse 22. Um, okay, so let's go, verse 22. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in labor pains. Everybody say, groaning together in labor pains. No need to sound like you're groaning, all right? It's in like teenagers. Um, we're groaning together in labor pains. Let's keep going, verse 23. Not only that. But we ourselves who have the Spirit as first fruits, we groan, everyone say groan. <laughs> we groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So, something about groaning going on here. Now, it is not the teenage groaning of like, I don't want to get up in the morning, mom, that type of thing. It is specifically the pain that you experience, not you, but some of you, or generally speaking, experience giving birth. So uh, if your translation doesn't clarify that it's labor pains, it's missed a bit there. So it's you're groaning in the pains of giving birth. Um, would anyone like to share how painful that is? No. Because <laughs> I don't know. Um, and back then, they don't have that. What's that thing? The in the back and... Yeah, yeah. The matrix. Um yeah, they, they don't have these things in, in back then, right? So the, the groaning pains of, of childbirth. So two things are groaning. Tim, if you chuck up the next one. Creation itself is groaning in these pains as it's trying to give birth. And we ourselves are groaning in this labor pain because we're trying to give birth. So Tim, can you chuck up the next one? The birth, obviously is this future end that we're looking for. If we're in the midst of groaning pains right now in ourselves and in this world, all of the brokenness, it's because it wants to give birth to the actual world that God intends to create in the end, where we become the full children of God as we're meant to be, and the world is not broken and corrupt. That's the idea, right? So we're heading towards the birth, and that's why the end is not the end, but actually the beginning of life. Now, the reason why we don't really know what the new creation is going to be like is by way of analogy, you imagine you're a little baby and you live in this warm bath and it's great and it's dark and you hear like kind of whale noises and stuff like that. And then, you know, let's say you could like potentially um, be like, hey, guess what? Real life's about to begin. That baby's going to be like, say what? This is real life. This is good life. The bath life. And then what happens? You give, they give, you know, I mean, I don't know, but they come out and, <laughs> and then they're like screaming because imagine that process, right? You're just beautiful, comfortable, warm life. And then you have to 
come out and then and then you're like oh my goodness i have to breathe and like what is the light and the giants and like everything like that right stay alive stay alive so the mind freaks out um and it would have no idea the, the, the difference between life in the womb and life as we know it, right? Just like we have no idea the, the, the brokenness of this world and its labor pains, what's next? The real birthing of who we are and who God intends us to be. Um, and the, the weird thing is it's like we're groaning in our own labor pains because as it says at the, at the end of verse uh, 23, we are eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our, our bodies. We're, we're waiting to become who God intends us to be. Okay, here's where we do some random science. Um, so I, I was like, you know those like alien movies where like some virus comes inside of a person and it eats its way out, like type thing, and the person's just like, yeah. I was like, I wonder if there's any like things like that in the real world. Any animals that actually, and there are. Um, and so if, if you look, if you just Google animals that give birth and die, um, interestingly, here, here we go. So the first hit on Google says, there are four common species of animals who die soon after giving birth. These are the octopus, the squid, salmon, and the common mayfly. For the most part, the males die soon after fertilizing the female's egg. And females live only long enough to birth their young before dying. That's, that's rough, hey. That's, yeah, that's a bad deal. Um, another particularly difficult one is porcupines. Can you imagine why? <laughs> so apparently porcupine spikes, they are actually soft until a few hours after birth. Some might say, hallelujah, in the porcupine world, right? That's good creation. Um, except that sometimes the porcupines can go down backwards. Yeah. So even if they're soft, that's still, that's still bad. That's a terrible way um, yeah, to give birth. All right, but the worst of all is this thing called a, a stegodiphus lineatus, right, which is a spider. And let me read this. Um, it takes it to the whole new level. Right after she lays an egg sac, the mother's tissues start to degrade. Once the spiderlings hatch, the mother regurgitates her own liquefied inside and the babies start to eat that. Nine days later, they suck up the last of her fluids and strike out to eat their own mum, leaving nothing but an empty shell. That's gross. And if you Google this spider, it looks like it would do that. It is a bad, like, I don't like spiders. Some spiders, you're like, no, 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 that's, that's bad. So uh, this happens in the real world. Um, and in fact, it's got nothing to do with us. So uh, we, we are not going to do that, right? It's not like you die and then you off out of your body and um, kick it on the ground. I didn't like that body anyway. No. I just wanted to do that to give your brains a break from the information assault. So, um, but it's kind of happening, right? But not really. Okay, so let's keep going um, because I'm mindful of time and, and wifey downstairs. Um, all right, so Tim, if you can chuck up the next one. It also says here in verse 20, um, 23, something like that. Yeah, um, we ourselves who have the spirit as the first fruits we groan within ourselves. So first fruits is this incredibly difficult concept where they're the first fruits, right? That didn't work on anyone. So first fruits, could you figure it? It was a joke. It's obvious. No one? All right. Amen. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're the first fruits, right? You, you're a farmer, as we all know what it's like to be a farmer, and um, the, you plant all these seeds, and they finally come, the first fruits are the first fruits. Right, Dirk? You're a farmer. Yeah. Um, shout out to the farmers in this world. Um, the first fruits come, and they're a symbol of the full harvest. You get a sense of how good the harvest is going to be from the first fruits. So if we are the first fruits right now, groaning in these pains of childbirth, obviously the full harvest is what we're, we're trying to become. Um, okay, cool. Let's keep reading. Let's keep going through this passage. I'm sorry if I'm going fast, but there's a lot to get through. Verse 24. 
it says this. Um, oh, yeah, Tim, can you skip, like, multiple ahead because we kind of covered stuff? Yep, one more. Okay, cool. Yep, so we're up to this one, those things. Verse 24. Now, in this hope we were saved, um, but hope that is seen is not hope because who hopes for what he sees? If we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. So that's why I've said in, in our suffering, in our present difficulty, we live with hope. And we have this perseverance that we have to undergo. Verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness because we don't know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. I won't get you to say groanings again, but it's that same thing. Now it's God's own spirit inside of our hearts as we contemplate the, the, the brokenness in this world and all that confuses us. And we're, we're, we are like brought to the point of perplexity and despair over what on earth we could do. There's this internal groaning that happens and that is God's heart. So God is now inside of us wanting this birthing process to happen as well. Um, and so that's what we've, we've got up there, groaning with the spirit. So now we come to verse, uh, we'll go verse 28. Verse 27 adds a bit to it, but we'll go verse 28. Now this is such a famous verse that it's so easy for you to just think what you've always thought about it when you read it. But please try and just keep this whole thing in your mind as we, we consider what the verse says, right? It says, but still, right, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. So Tim, if you could chuck up the next one, we're coming to the end and the next one, the end of our table. Could you just go one more? Actually, two more? Boom. All right, good. So this is our purpose. We are in this, pur- this birthing process of being conformed into Jesus' likeness, right? God's Son. And obviously, the end of that is that final birthing that happens where we become who we need to be. And um, this, is, uh, this passage is a bit con- complex but the general thing I think is, is it's saying, I'll try and, be, try and say it simply, is that um, so God foresaw that humanity would sin and we would fall and this world would come into the broken mess that it is. And he knew that he was going to send his son to go to the cross to die on behalf of us and that by doing that could raise the world from the dead into resurrection life. And then not only would Jesus do that, but then his followers would begin to go on that type of process as well, where we're dying to ourselves and we're dying to that false self and we're engaging with the sufferings of this world, entering into it like dying on a cross so that it can be raised up to this full, um, the end, right? The, the full creation. Um, and so God basically knows that he's get, there's going to be this process whereby Jesus starts, he's the first person, born, and then we, as his children, as the the co-heirs with Christ, the brothers and sisters, we also go on this journey of choosing to engage with the world in a way of compassionate, self-sacrificial love, where we feel the sufferings of what's going on in those around us and the brokenness of this world, and we choose to step into the brokenness so that we might try and raise it up into resurrection life. So we start to go on the same type of journey that Jesus does. And um, this, uh, as, as a, a lastly, the last word at the bottom, is, is that sense in which we're glorified even now. Because remember one of the first verses in verse 18, verse 17, says that we're children of God if we suffer with Christ in order that we might be glorified with him. So we have to engage in what Jesus did in this world, entering into the brokenness of it, like getting on our own crosses on behalf of others so that God can, through us, raise the world to be what it needs to be. Um, That's the general kind of 
gist of the passage. And now we're going to explain what it really means. So Tim, could you, um, could you, yeah, go to the next one. All right, so I'm, I'm going to try to boil it down now into five simple points. So Jesus' life is shaped by the cross, right? He came to love others by laying his own life down. It's this suffering love, self-sacrificing to, for the good of others. Next one, Tim. We are in a process of becoming like him, which is our journey of death to self, which we do by loving others. So we have that same type of journey as well, dying to that old self and becoming like Jesus, which we do by loving others. Next one, Tim. So we suffer with Jesus when we live like him or we, we love like him for the good of the world. We enter into the brokenness that we might be the hands and feet of Jesus who can lift it up, right? Next one, Tim. These sufferings that we're experiencing are the birth pains. So God is, is wanting to, to birth the world to be what he wants it to be, right? And for us to be what he wants us to be. Um, but it's actually the process that we're engaged in where all the difficulty that we experience in life, they are the birth pains where God is seeking to bring out of us what we're meant to be and of the world what we're meant to be, right? Um, and then last one. Tim, so this is what it means to be in the image of God as his representative priest in the world to love as Jesus did. I'm not going to unpack that because oh, it's already a lot of info. Um, so, Tim, could you actually go to the next one, right? So I just, oh, man, so small. Actually, not too small. Uh, I just want to show you that there's a bunch of other verses in the New Testament that say this same thing and just a lot simpler. Um, so Romans 8.18, that's the one we've already, we've already read. Suffer with Christ so we may glorify with him. And then 2 uh, Corinthians 1.5 says, For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow toward us, so also our comfort through Christ overflows towards you. These are things that Paul says. Philippians 3.10, my aim is to know Christ, to experience the power of his resurrection, to share in his sufferings and to be like him in his death. Colossians 1.24, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you and I fill up in my physical body for the sake of his body, the church, what is lacking in Christ's suffering. So Paul's like, I am part of Jesus' mission, suffering with him on behalf of the, the good of the world. And then the last one, um, rejoice in the degree that you have shared in the sufferings of Christ, so that when his glory is revealed, you may also rejoice and be glad. Um, and then, all right, we'll just do the next one, and then that's my last slide. Um, so at the end of Romans 8, again, another really famous passage where it's like nothing could be against us. God is for us, and it's really, really awesome. And then there's this really awkward bit in the middle. It's kind of like when you get a burger, and it's actually like a veggie patty. And you're just like, ooh, um, it's like that. So there's really, really awesome stuff. And then right in the middle, verse 35, it's like, so who could separate us from the love of God? And we're like, nothing. And then Paul's like, let me tell you about my own life. And then he lists off things that you can read about he experiences in other parts of the New Testament. He goes, can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And the answer is no, they can't separate us from the love of Christ. But he goes, but that is the reality that we're all living in. As it's written, because of you, we're being put to death all day long, and we are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. But even though that's the case, they won't separate us from the love of God and this birthing process that he is going through that will bring everything to the place that God intends it to be in the end. Um, so, Tim, if you maybe just go back to the, the finished table one. Thanks, Tim. And I will um, start to kind of finish. So, my wife actually inspired this message. She works uh, at a counselling service, and... Um, she can't, she can't tell me much of the stories, obviously, because it's like a counselling service. Um, and, but it's a really hard job. And she comes home, and you, you can only really have like an, an uh shift 
or like a, that was a really bad shift, right? Like where you couldn't do anything to help this person, it was really bad, or like, you know, they're just in a really bad state, but at least they're kind of just still in that state. That's basically as good as the job gets. She never comes home, and it's like, oh, what a day. I, like, saved five people's lives. Like, it was just so good. They really have me to, th like, never happens, right? It's, it's always just sad and emotionally burdensome. Um, and it can be, you know, sad or worse, basically. And th for me, this is like a, a, a paradigm that helps me process that. And, you know, I, I hope it helps her and I hope it helps you guys process what's going on. Is that when you experience and you're confronted with either the brokenness of the world out there or the things that you have to experience, right, and the difficulty of your own life, it's birth pains, it's the, the difficulty of this process that God is engaged in in bringing the whole world to be what it needs to be. As we experience the difficulty of trying to get, uh, you know, put off our sin and um, become like Christ and that, the pain of stopping being selfish and becoming loving, it's birth pains. Um, you know, it's like t uh, parents of teenagers where the teenagers are just like so rude to their parents and the parents just cop it and cop it and cop it. That's the birth pains of that child becoming who they're meant to be. It's difficult, but you're engaged in it in a, in a Christ-like way, right? Even if you just, you look out in the world and you see like cl climate change crisis and just how messed up we are as an entire like 8 billion people and there's just this burden, this groaning, it's because the birth pains are going on. You hear about abuse of children or just about, you know, how messed up the church is. And there's just that like, oh my God. Like, what do I even think about this? It's birth pains, and we're groaning with God, suffering with Christ, as we're broken over how terrible it is. But we hope that the birthing is going to come in the end. Even like, I don't know if people hear about this stuff, but the whole like faith deconstruction journey that. Apparently, you know, like all of the young adult American Christians are going through or whatever. And I know it's some of us, this journey where you're like, everything I used to believe was so simple, but now I'm not sure. And you just go on this, like, this wilderness journey where you're like, I don't know what to think. I don't know what to believe. I want to know what's true, but I'm just so lost and perplexed at times. Birth pains. It's the suffering of this whole world as God seeks by, by working in the midst of it to bring it into what it's meant to be. Um, it could be your work relationships. It could just be your relationships in general. They're not what they should be, and you, you want it so badly, but you don't know what to do. It's this birth pains. You know, I just, I just want it to be the way it should be. I want to be helpful. I want to be loving. I want to, I want to count for what God's doing. I want to see God work. I don't want there to be injustice. I don't want people to get abused. And, and there's just this helplessness, and you're like, I don't know what to do, but I have to love in some way. That's you experiencing those, those painful, suffering birth pains. So the reason I share this is because, simply, I just want us to have the right expectations of life. If you have the wrong expectations of life, you are going to be discouraged. If you think it should be all nice and easy and that everything should just work, you're just going to be really confused and saddened. But if you see that, there's this process going on, not just in you, but in the whole world of this God who engages in the brokenness of the world by dying on one of its crosses so that he can influence and change us from within. Then you see actually not pain and suffering and meaninglessness, you see a birthing process in the world. You have this perspective. This is where Paul says we don't walk by um, sight, but we walk by faith. We don't walk by faith, we walk by sight. Same thing. Um, if you just look on the surface of things, it just doesn't look that good. There's a lot of brokenness, and we're pretty sheltered, so there's a lot more brokenness. But if you have faith, you can at least see the birthing process, and you can believe that God's going to birth something good in the end. 
we, we often present Christianity by the ideal, right? And ideals can be inspiring. They can make you want to aim to be a good Christian. But they can also be burdensome because they're ideals. And you can't reach them all the time. And if all you're ever told is the ideals, like it will just be a burden. But if you thoroughly know what reality is like, it's actually, it's actually liberating. If you know that in the brokenness, it's a birthing process, you can choose to engage in it in the way that Jesus would. So, yeah, I was going to ask at the start. It wouldn't work, so I didn't ask. But like, hey, put your hand up if you had a good week, you know, and like a few people would. Um, put your hand up if you had a bad week, and no one would really, because, you know, they did. Um, and then I was going to say, put your hand up if you felt like you were really, like you did really well at your Christianity this week. And obviously no one would, because... <laughs> Oh, I did a great job, right? And, you know, maybe some people felt like they did a really good job of their Christianity this week. But maybe a lot didn't, and they felt like it was a struggle. And then I was going to ask the question again at the end. In light of the fact that the sufferings of this world and the difficulty we experience are the groanings and of labor pains, you say, hey, did you actually have a pretty good week as a Christian? in light of how difficult the process is. And I would hope that maybe you'd realize, oh, actually, maybe I did, because I'm in that process, and it's difficult, and it's hard. Maybe I'm actually doing the right thing. Maybe I'm actually walking with God, and that's why I'm groaning, because he's in me, and he's groaning as well. Maybe I am broken over the world, because God's broken over the world. It's the birth pains. So I just, I just offer, I mean, please go and read this passage again. I can post this table on, on Facebook or whatever. But um, yeah, please just read it and then just think. And there's a lot of different parts, but I think if you put it together, it makes sense of this world. It's, it's a realistic, it's a faith perspective, but it's a realistic faith perspective of how broken the world is. But yet we still believe that there's a God who's at work in it. But we know that he works by a cross. And so he gets into the brokenness and dies there so that he can raise it again. And then he calls us to come and take up your own cross in, in whatever circumstance you're in so that you can die in love for those around you that it might be raised to life. So I'm going to close now. Um, I'm just going to read a little bit of Isaiah 53. Um, and so if the music team wants to come up... Um, yeah, I'm just going to read a few verses of Isaiah 53. Again, famous passage, but I just want to present this beautiful picture of Jesus as someone who's doing what, you know, what I think this passage is calling us to do, engaging in the difficulty of the world out of love. It says this, Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It says, prophecy about Jesus. He grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sufferings who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised. We didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses. He carried our pains, but we in turn regarded him as stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. As Jesus doing this very thing of engaging with the brokenness of this world, to try and help. That's what we're, I mean, he, he does help. He does win in the end, but that's what it feels like for us. I just want to help this broken world, and it's so hard, so I'm just, I'm just going to try love like Jesus. And in the pain, at least I know that they're birth pains. So let's pray. Thank you for, um, for journeying with me through that. Father, um, 
we call you Father because we are your children. And you have brought us into that relationship. And you are a Father who, who you've brought us into the family, but you want to birth us so that we can truly be um, who we're meant to be in this world, can be what you want it to be. And as a good father, you are going to bring it there because of your love. But I thank you so much that you do not parent from a distance, but you are so engaged. You're in the thick of every brokenness in this world. You experience every one of our sufferings with us um, because you love us and you journey beside us as we walk through the wilderness. And I just thank you so much that you are the God of the cross. You're not, you're not just the God of the, the promise that doesn't get fulfilled and just leaves me going, well, why is that happening? Or I don't understand. You're God who says, yeah, I'll be fine from a distance. You're the God who says, yeah, I'll fulfill the promise by coming to be on the cross in your midst suffering with you to bring it to new life. And I thank you that you've shown us that as a, as a path for us to follow as well, a path of dying to ourselves, getting on our crosses for the sake of those around us. And I just pray that your spirit would help us to have this perspective, um, to have hope and to have faith, to understand what you're doing in the world so that we wouldn't be uh, completely broken by despair, but that we would enter into the difficulty as people who know where it's heading and choose to be part of the good that you're doing in the world. Um, so we just, yeah, we commit ourselves to you and I just pray um, that your spirit would, would encourage those of us who are particularly struggling in this season. Yeah, that you are birthing the good in them. Amen.